Welcome to What To Watch with me, Toby Earl, the show which sends you belated best wishes for April Fool's Day, which was yesterday on the 31st of March. Until we buy a better and more correct calendar, this show will speak to the sharpest stars off the most punctual screen in the corner of the room or in your file of faxes. Coming up on the show today, Aidan Gillen reveals if the truth is out there in new sci-fi series, Project Blue Book. Joel Kinnaman and Mireille Enos contemplate life stranded in a log cabin at 20 Below when talking about preparing for Hannah. Famalam's Tom Mucci and Roxy Sternberg talk about the return of the critically acclaimed sketch series, Famalam. Polish your best wedding hat as Nell Hudson discusses Nancy's nuptials and more in Victoria. And I'll give you my top TV picks of the week, the shows which if you miss will make you lonelier than anyone who would develop a taste for ice cubes made from hot dog water. <coughs> Escape from the current political turbulence by escaping to the political turbulence of 1848 in the new series of Victoria on ITV Sundays at 9pm. Revolutions are spreading across Europe and Victoria's own reign is threatened. But it's not all bad news. Loyal staffer Nancy Skerritt is soon to be hitched. Nell Hudson plays Skerritt, and we spoke about suffrage and Skerritt's friendship with her monarch. There's a seamstress who works for the Queen, who is a new character played by Sabrina Bartlett, who comes in and she is a chartist, and so Skerritt kind of learns about all that side of things through her, and we see her eyes being opened to the possibility of one man, one vote. But Skerritt doesn't really, she's not a very political character in that way. I think at the time as well, you know, it was sort of, I mean, the thing that's up for debate is whether every working man should have the vote, and it was very much the opinion of a lot of people that they shouldn't, including the working man. We see... Mr. Penge, the sort of head manservant downstairs, saying it's ridiculous that these chartists are, no are trying to gain to rights. Down. And he is someone who wouldn't have had to vote at the time, but was against, you know, his own furthering of his own rights. Certainly at that time as well, it definitely was more unusual for there to be sort of um, cross-class stratification friendships. But Victoria was, I think, notoriously um, kind of informal with all of her servants and uh you've got to respect her for that i think she just i think she appreciated anyone who was honest and real and kind and didn't let that get in the way of sort of her respect for them as human beings and she saw she saw everyone equally i mean when we left garrett in the christmas special at the end of series two she had accepted charles francatelli's proposal of marriage so that's where we we see them there unfianced Garrett's obviously digging her heels in a little bit, as she always does, and there's that kind of push and pull that they have with each other where she feels very duty-bound to her career and to her loyalty to the Queen as well. But, I mean, they are engaged, so there's only so many places that can go. It's funny, because Queen Victoria, I think, was the uh, first sort of big public figure to wear white to her wedding before that women didn't necessarily wear white to their wedding they just sort of wore their nicest dress that they had they definitely didn't buy a dress for the occasion of the day like women do now um so yes I, I sort of was interested to see what that might look like for a kind of a civilian in Victorian times because obviously in series one we got to see Queen Victoria's own wedding to Albert and how splendid and like incredible that was so yeah it's kind of nice kind of seeing what a normal wedding might look like at that time. Do I not get a curtsy? You are not the sovereign, Papa. Oh. Daisy, the writer, told me that Scarrett was going to die well before um, we started shooting series three, so I was kind of well prepared. <laughs> I didn't just sort of read a script and go, hang on, what? Um, but, yeah, it was funny. It sort of wasn't until, really, after I'd filmed her dying that, uh, it really hit me. But when I did read it, oh my God, Ottilie Wilford, Daisy's daughter, actually wrote the episode in which Skerritt dies. And it's so moving. It's so brilliantly done. And I, I think I read it on the train going back down from York. We were kind of back and forth filming. 
earlier episodes in the series and I read it on the train and I was just like publicly crying my eyes out because it was so beautifully done and I hope I hope everyone has a, a good reaction to it. Now for what we call WTW. PC T Q O T every week. W What's a watcher's pop culture Twitter quote of the week? What's a celebrity said on Twitter? <laughs> This week. Have I died and gone to heaven? Inquired location, 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 and relocation, relocation, presenter, 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 Phil, 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 Spencer, Spencer, Spencer. In a scene so reminiscent of Michelangelo's celestial firmament drifting across the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Although Michelangelo forgot to paint three land rovers. Comedy can be used to shine a light on truth and make people reevaluate long held beliefs. Sketch So Famalam has achieved this by revealing there are millions of pounds awaiting to be collected from Nigerian philanthropist Prince Alusi, whose random emails are routinely ignored. The acclaimed comedy has returned for a second series, all of it ready for your consumption on the iPlayer. And Tom Mucci and Roxy Sternberg came into the studio to share how Prince Alusi can be contacted. And who else will meet in this new run? Mr. Mucci does a remarkable job because he leads it and he sets off the pace. I think, Tom, you're like the talisman of, of the show. You're like the lucky rabbit's foot. You're like the amethyst stone of this show. Like, because you lead, you've led uh, episode one, Eclipse. Okay. And you've led episode one. Uh, season two. Of season oh, two okay. as well. So like, <laughs> so he's the anchor man. So he sets the pace real nice. And it's, uh, it, I, I appreciate I, that. I think the great thing about the show is that we're able to tackle things that go on in the culture and the social media, mm. but in a clever and fun way with real high concept value and production value. A lot of time is spent by Tom Marshall uh, in mm. the in the world of social media, like our director, and um, and he is a big kind of he. I think the. He's got his ears to the streets. He's got his ears to the streets and yeah. the sort of like new technology and stuff like that. I think some of, because me and him are like the same age. So we mm -hmm. grew up just at the advent of like the internet gaining good speed. Yeah, yeah. Where social, where the, conflu the confluence of social media hadn't happened yet. So like he is kind of amazed and startled by it all. And so that's why there's a lot of commentary on it. And it's just, it's interesting how much it's taken over our lives and, uh, and how much of an effect it's having on, just on us. Um, so yeah, a lot of the time it will be from Tom saying like, "Yeah, I saw this on on social media." Like, that's my Geordie accent. Yeah. <laughs> in case. yeah. She's new, isn't she? Is she new? That character. Yeah. Yeah. She's new. Um, can you tell me a little bit about her? Sure. Because she's introduced to us in the first episode in an explosive manner. Yes. She's got a a, a wonderful Kim Kardashian esque uh, rear end, which is. Uh, that's that's Wunder. special effects right yes. there. That's, that's, that's not my tochas. I wish it was, but um, yeah, she enters with a bang. She's kind of like a Kim Kardashian. She's a Kim Kardashian, char and it is and it is a commentary on that obsession with um, with with altering what is natural and mm. what is already amazing and beautiful, and just taking it to that extreme. And we've taken it to that extreme just to show sometimes how ludicrous those uh, those things can be, and also just someone who's very. Self-obsessed. Her character is particularly quite self-obsessed. Yeah, narcissistic. Yeah. Is that a rapper at the end there with the crazy coloured hair? Yes, it right, is a okay. rapper, and, yeah. it's, and 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 he pops up later in the series, uh, and he has a song, and he has a very interesting outcome, and it's and it's John <laughs> McMillan, uh, the genius, doing his uh, wonderful uh, uh, approximation of our friend from across the pond who is currently uh, uh, incarcerated. He is incarcerated. Yeah, yes. he's incarcerated. Yeah. yeah. I feel like we also have a responsibility because as, as people are laughing, we're telling them real messages. So it's like you're laughing and say, ha, 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 that's, that's actually true. <laughs> Maybe I should change my life. Is that the same for you, Roxy? Do you, do, you, do you think that this has the potential to change the way people think? And yeah. I mean, London is just so multicultural and just so wonderful. I went to a talk yesterday in a Carla talk um, and he was talking about some of his friends came over from America to his area, mm. Labrick Grove, and they were like, wow, this is insane how everyone is living harmoniously. You know, the Palestinians, the Moroccans, the oh. Caribbeans. And that is, you know, that's how I see London. I see London as a multicultural, beaut beautiful haven. Mm. And we're showing little snippets of the different people that exist in London. 
um, and America and Nigeria and the world. Yes, absolutely. But it is like to take it further than London. It's it's because there's people in Middlesbrough, Newcastle, Scotland, who and Ireland who have commented on this, and so it feels like there's a lot of commentary of just UK. There's mm. a lot of UK things, and there's things that just people can relate to outside of it just being like London centric. But it's there's so much of our rich London culture that's like infused and West African culture and stuff. If you look at uh, BC Bemi's character mm. over there, who's just like you know decked out in regalia and that's just a bold statement that is a bold statement about what the show is and yeah. like its creators and what kind of flavor and seasoning we're bringing out to people Welcome back to What To Watch with me, Toby Earl. The show that aims to guide you through your week's viewing and give you a glimpse behind the scenes and hear from the stars. Coming up, I'll give you the TV picks of the week, which are almost as good as actor Kevin McNally hiring a jacket for his role as Captain Mannering in new episodes of Dad's Army and realising the last person it was hired by was Arthur Lowe, who played Captain Mannering in Dad's Army. But first... A log cabin and sub-zero temperatures came up in conversation when I met Joel Kinnaman and Mireille Enos from Hannah, the new thriller streaming on Amazon Prime Video. Eric, played by Kinnaman, has raised his daughter Hannah in frozen isolation, and he described how he found spending that time alone. It's very good writing. I mean, that was what um, really drew me to the project, was that it was very well written, and that also... Um, I and mean, one of David Farr's great talents is all the stuff that he doesn't write. Mm -hmm. He doesn't over-explain things. He, mm -hmm. The dialogue is pretty sparse. So you, mm -hmm. when you read what the, what the characters are saying to each other, you also read all the stuff that they're not saying and, and what's going on between them. And that's, the, that's what's difficult. Um, the worst scenario you can be in as an actor is when you've you're faced with writing where the characters are standing like staring at each other explaining who they are yeah. what they want what the story is and when everything is explained verbally then there's yeah. nothing left to play that's right and um it's better to just read that in a book um so i mean that's what his his writing is is so elevated in that way the audiences are so smart now yeah. i mean we're the evolution of the audience i think is something that can't be understated because we've been presented with so much intelligent material in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. So the audience expects the storytelling to be much more intelligent. And I think a lot more people are drawn to complex narratives. But I will say, I think we are, have been heading into and are continuing to head into a kind of a renaissance in that way, where especially in this model of the sh short series, people are taking more and more risks and the writing is getting yeah. more and more complex yeah. and brave and cinematic. Yeah. Well, I know that that was one of the big themes that David wanted to explore is what makes a family, um, these kind of like archetypal ideas of mother, father, child. And, um, you know, we have very unconventional versions of that. Yeah. I mean, this father is teaching his daughter how to choke people out and um, <laughs> and this mother is a murderer and um, so people can be multifaceted you can you can have dark aspects and you can still be a nurturer I want to give you a normal life but I'm not normal am I that is that something that did draw you to this the fact that it does look at those archetypes and ask questions of them like how stuck are we with these ideas of what a mother is what a father is and how a child relates to them that this, this, is, this asks, should we be sort of presenting these sort of traditional old models? I don't know that it's presenting the idea that this is a better version um, of how to do it, but I think it's just saying this, there, there are so many different versions and let's look at this one and what the effects are for positive or negative. I mean, the woman that Eric creates is devoid of like, social gaze you know she she's like an individual in the world who who acts of her own impulses she's not she's not behaving in reference to anyone that's a very powerful tool he handed her but he also has shielded her from any awareness of 
her past. So, and all also of, instilled like complete suspicion yes, of every other of person. Yes, human being. Um, yeah. Which is, you know, a strong choice, strong parental choice. Yeah. Is it the right one? <laughs> uh, no. No. <laughs> no. No, I don't think so. And now for the TV news in briefs. In You Think What's Going On Now Is Strange, Just You Wait News, the trailer for the third series of Stranger Things has been released, revealing the key themes of the new series. Local journalism, pool parties and shopping, which is pretty strange. And that was the TV news in briefs. Now, stop wondering whose round it was after Sophie Turner downed a glass of wine at an ice hockey match. Cause it's time for my TV picks of the week. <laughs> what with Brexit and international political turmoil, if an alien civilization did make contact, we'd have to ask them to wait their turn once we've got everything else sorted out. But, asks new sci-fi thriller Project Blue Book, have we already been contacted? Based on the real investigations by the United States Air Force, which began in 1952, Aidan Gillen stars as Dr. J. Allen Hynek, the astronomer and ufologist who studied reports of extraterrestrial sightings. The series is on Sci-Fi, Wednesdays at 9pm, and we discussed if, yep, the truth is out there. The thing about these sightings is that uh, quite a, a number of them were are actually believable. So we have that as the backdrop and of course once one person sees something other people are at least going to be looking. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah the background is of course the Cold War and uh, fear of the other, the Russians specifically in the case of the Americans. Mm -hmm. um, and of course governments are happy to have people living in, to have at least a low wattage of fear and paranoia buzzing in, in the background. Um, in order to get people to do what they want. And of course, that's happening now. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's happened, it's been happening ever since, and the dial gets turned up and down a little. Mm. Um, and certainly is uh, evident that that's happening in, you know, uh, both of those two countries, actually, at the moment. I like the word, I like the, um, it's interesting that you use the word optimism there in, in, in the early 50s, because that, that's when America did emerge as this shiny, thrilling, like, uh, technicolour superpower. Yeah. And, and yet, of course, the, the backdrop to it was, 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 hor was, was horrendous. And, and sort of what, what, drove that, what drove that ability to, to, to kind of, like, thrive. Yeah, and I think we have, have in this show, tried to just weave those, um, those feelings or those moods uh, together, because they certainly were there. And um, so for, for one person, a saucer, flying saucer, you know, dropping down on the middle of a country road in front of them would have been a terrifying thing. And for millions and millions of kids, that's exactly what they would wish. You know, there's a percentage, uh, quite a, you know, decent percentage that were not only inexplicable, but quite convincingly, uh, you know, something else. Mm. But he remained it. He never found the proof he was really looking for, but he spent the rest of his life looking. So it's an interesting arc, you know, from skeptic to believer is kind of what they say. I think he was always, I think he was always both skeptical and uh, a believer um, and always open-minded. But, you know, towards the latter end of that career, you know, um, I don't know, he definitely shifted down. His mind was just a little bit more open. And it would have been great for him. I think. I think what he really wanted to, you know, he really wanted to find some empirical evidence, uh, you know, that we had been visited. And there were a few cases, you know, that did touch on it. Um, you know, even if one, you know, all, all, all it needs is one. How the hell would you know what types of planes the Russians have or don't have? The Russians have nothing to do with this. One of the first things I did in preparation for this was just as I was, you know, I just thought, well, the first thing I want to do is watch Close Encounters of the Third Kind again, because it was a big film for me growing up. So I got my Blu-ray out and put it in. And I went straight to the trailer, the original long-form trailer, first of all, because uh, 
I had a you know a memory of this trailer being a, something like a kind of a documentary style trailer that which they used to do in the 70s. And one of the first people to come up, I think he's like he's like either second or first, is uh, Heineck talking about his classification system, the first kind, second kind, third kind, close encounters. So that was kind of chilling, and uh, I took it as a sign because that's the kind of guy I am. Um, so yeah, I had an awareness um, that I that I'd seen him or knew something about him. Mm. That was it. It was it was limited to that. Of whatever age I am, I was a bit obsessed with you know space, if you like, and you know just ex fantastic stories going on out there because of course I'd seen uh, Star Wars two years previously. Um, which was, you know, a kind of huge movie for anyone of that generation. Um, but this one was more earthly, earthly, earthbound, real. It just seemed like something that could happen um, with the uh, Roy Neary character and all that. And uh, it was just all very seductive and just planted all, all these ideas in front of you. And of course, you just wanted it to happen. You wanted to see it. You wanted to be there. You wanted to be taken away, even you know. Did did you though? Like when the screws are coming loose and the the panels coming away from the wall. Yeah, it had this mix. It was kind of like a horror film, but behind it there's this orange glowing light. I mean, you saw the way that kid was mm. just walked towards it gleefully um, because he didn't know really any different, and I felt like the kid. That's it for this week. Thank you very much for joining me. I'll be back on the 15th of April. But to tide you over, you can watch this when it streams on London Live's Twitter at half past 12, that's lunchtime, on Tuesday. I'll be back on the 15th of April, so keep watching. <laughs>